Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to this special live discussion um, on uh, 10 years on why the Arab Spring still matters. Um, tonight's event is hosted by the Socialist Workers Party, um, and my name is Nadia Sayyid, um, and I'll be hosting and facilitating tonight's discussion. Um, I suppose to start with, you know, 10 years ago, you know, we saw a wave of mass popular uprisings and revolts sweep across you know, North Africa and the Middle East, um, toppling dictators that have been in power for decades. Um, and we've seen um, that those waves of revolts um, are actually far from over, uh, with more recent waves in the region um, and going further than that as well. Um, and I suppose to remind people of the <laughs> momentous events that started um, uh, about a decade ago now, um, we've got a short video uh, to show. Um, so the video will play in just a sec. Uh, ten years ago, um, a revolution swept Egypt, uh, part of a regional uprising, uh, whereby millions of people took to the streets in order to topple uh, the country's dictator. Uh, despite initial gains, uh, this revolution was uh, fought uh, by a military coup and a full-fledged counter-revolution. Uh, ten years later, uh, the situation in Egypt um, and most of the Arab world uh, it could be argued that it's worse uh, than it was when uh, these uprisings started. Does that mean that uh, revolution is a bad idea? Does that mean that it was uh, wrong to go on revolt? Uh, I don't think so. I still think that there are uh, so many things that we should cherish and celebrate about uh, what happened, in addition to learning uh, some lessons from for the next uprising. So I hope people got uh, from that vi uh, video a bit of a flavor um, of what tonight's discussion is going to be like. Um, and really, this event is about celebrating the resistance we saw 10 years ago, um, but at the same time, you know, drawing lessons from those struggles as well. Um, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers tonight who will help us um, do that in the hour plus that we have. Um, so to introduce them one by one, um, first we have Egyptian revolutionary journalist and activist Hassam Al Hamalawi. So, a massive welcome to Hassam. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce next um, who uh, is joining our panel, Mozan uh, Al Nil, who is an activist from Sudan um, and somebody who's uh, written uh, towards numerous blogs and so on. So, a massive welcome uh, to you, Mozan. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, we have Anne Alexander, um, who is an author um, and a member of the Socialist Worker Party um, in Britain. Um, so a big welcome to Anne Alexander. Um, and a massive welcome really to all three of our speakers. Um, it's fantastic to have you all here leading the discussion tonight. Um, and we'll hear, be hearing from you all very soon. Um, but before we do that, um, I'd also like to say a massive uh, welcome to everyone who's going to be joining us um, from home, you know, whether you're watching on Facebook, um, on YouTube, and actually throughout this discussion tonight, we want to be hearing from you as well. Um, so please do send us your thoughts um, and questions by commenting on the live stream um, and keep sharing the event um, so we can have as wide a reach as possible um, for the discussion this evening. Now, there's much to discuss this evening, um, so we'll move straight on. Um, now, you know, the wave of revolts, I think, that we saw, you know, beginning in uh, Tunisia and quickly spreading um, across uh, the region uh, really, you know, lit the aspirations, not just of people uh, in those countries, um, but really around the world as well. Um, you know, for a society that's ridded of dictatorship, um, of oppression um, and of deep inequality. Um, I mean, I personally remember um, Al Jazeera uh, in my family home uh, never turning off. Um, in those months um, and whenever me and my siblings got home um, actually you know constantly wanting to know what happened uh, in the squares in the demonstrations and so on um, and celebrating each time uh, a dictator had been toppled um, and so here I mean I want to bring you in first for some um, you were an activist in Egypt uh, during the uprising uh, back in uh, a, a decade ago um, you know what was the experience like for you 
um, on the ground. Um, and at what point really did you uh, realize that you were in the midst of a revolution? Uh, I don't think uh, any of the um, uh, of the activists who were involved in um, in organizing uh, on January 25th, 2011, um, had uh, high expectations about uh, the fact that we are starting a revolt. Um, the ceilings of uh, demands at the time were the impeachment of our notorious interior minister and. Um, and calls for investigating police torture uh, and stopping police torture uh, in general. Um, and I remember I was asked on the morning of uh, January 25th by one of the pundits on Twitter uh, whether I was expecting a revolution today, and I was uh, I was skeptic. Uh, not that because uh, the idea of a revolt was uh, was very distant. Actually, anyone who's been following the rise of dissent in Egypt in the years. Mm -hmm. Uh, leading up to 2011, uh, should not have been uh, surprised by the revolt. Uh, but at the same time, you never know what the spark will be and when exactly uh, uh, it's going to start. And this is what happened on January 25th. So with the protests uh, swelling on that day and then continuing, um, I started thinking that we are heading for a revolt if we manage to sustain the mobilizations uh, till Friday, which is the Friday of anger, uh, January 28th. This was the day when we beat the police, and I knew that we are heading for a full-fledged uh, revolution. Um, thank you very much um, for that, uh, Hassan, um, and we'll be bringing you in um, very shortly as well. Um, you know, I want to really turn to uh, Mozan now. Um, I'm really asked the same question because um, in Sudan, you know, we saw a wave, uh, we saw a part of a wave of, of um, popular uprisings, um, you know, years after what we've seen begin uh, a decade ago, um, you know, beginning in uh, 2018 and so on. And so to ask you the same question, you know, being in uh, Sudan uh, in the midst of uh, uh, the resistance, you know, at what stage and um, was it clear to you that you were in the midst of a, a revolution and, and how really uh, did uh, the uprising in, in Sudan begin? Um, you know, was there, as Hassan had said, you know, deeper rooted processes um, going on years before? Thank you, Nadia. Well, um, <clears throat> Sorry. Well, on contrary to what Hassan described, actually, uh, in Sudan, for a very long time, we thought that every movement is leading to a revolution. And maybe that comes from the fact that um, the Bashir's regime, which governed Sudan for 30 years, um, it, th this regime came with a coup right after a revolution or an uprising. So the memory of the revolution was still there. And that was also strengthened by what happened in Egypt. So the, the word revolution was not something that's mocked anymore. It became more realistic. It's something that we can imagine happening because we saw something similar, even if it was not completed, but we saw it happening over there. And actually it's worth noting that even in 2011, we did, there were some attempts of protests in Sudan. There were some attempts of um, um, going out, calls to go out to the street as early as the 30th of January, um, 2011. So five days after the 25th of January in um, in Egypt. But um, I would now call them not the most well thought or responsible calls at the time. And the rest of the objective reasons for a revolution or a uprising to be successful were not there yet. And it did lead to the arrest of many. And as you said, there were several uprisings coming after that in 2012, in 2013. Uh, in 2013, it was also the one that was um, directly oppressed by the Janjaweed or the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces. And we saw them, they were utilized uh, to, um, to, to fight protesters for the first time inside the big cities or inside Khartoum. And that followed on with several uh, uprisings. Uh, however, I would say that the moment that probably not just me, but a lot of Sudanese people so that this is something different happening is when um, the buildings of the ruling party of the National Congress Party were burned in Adbara. And Adbara is the first city where the protests started um, um, at the um, beginning of December 2018, which were basically um, high school kids that were protesting the increase in price for their sandwich that happened because of the increase of the prices of bread or what the governments, the several governments that we had called it, uh, uh, until this one called desubsidization, although one would argue that there is no subsidization. Anyway, it's just, 
inflation and a failed economy. But anyway, so that's what started it all. And seeing that photo was totally something different for all of us. We saw that we, we can actually burn down the buildings of the ruling party. Those are the same buildings that we were even terrified to just like pass by, you know, months ago. Spraying a slogan on them was impossible to think about even. But that happened on the, on, on the beginning of December. And by mid-December, there was already a call prior to that, months prior to that, by the Sudanese Professors Association, who put out a memorandum for the increase of the minimum wage and uh, basically asked people to march to the parliament uh, by the 25th of uh, December to demand an increase of the minimum wage. But um, by the 25th of December, the, the country was burning. People were already in the streets and the demands of the people in the streets have already exceeded those of the elites that was um, you know, phrased by the Sudanese Professionals Association to some extent. And the Sudanese Professionals Association had to take on the call and turn the, their march from a march to the parliament to a march to the uh, presidential palace and the demands from um, increasing minimum wage to basically for the regime to be toppled. And that started a wave of protesting that took on to the sit-in uh, on the 6th of April in front of the headquarters of the military. And I would say for me, one of the moments that really showed me that this is a revolution, not just an uprising, I would still argue that it is to some extent, um, is when my sister told me that she was walking the streets of the sit-in and the sit-in controlled several streets in the middle of the country, in the middle, middle of the capital, sorry. She was walking the streets of the sit-in at midnight, it was dark, there were a lot of men and she was not afraid because it was a different place, because we created a different system. We created a place where we are not oppressed, where we felt like we owned this place more. We can walk the street. And yeah, that's my personal moment of knowing this seems to be a revolution. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mazan. And I want to come back uh, to a point you've made um, quite shortly. Um, I just wanted to announce um, so far that actually we have uh, 300 people uh, watching uh, the live event at the moment um, so people can keep uh, sharing uh, the event um, and that's on uh, Facebook, Instagram, what have you um, and let's uh, get the reach as wide as possible. Um, but coming back to what you were talking about, uh, Mozan, you know, um, in particularly uh, around, you know, the question of the sit-ins and how that became a space where, you know, really you could start to see a different vision um, of society um, as people's confidence grew. Um, you know, I want to uh, talk. You know, ask you a little bit about the the question of the importance of uh, different spaces and so on, because you know most of the you know mass mobilizations you know during the revolutions of the past um, decades have involved you know collective organization in you know key locations and spaces like public uh, symbolic public spaces like city squares um, and streets, you know uh, workplaces um, through mass strikes. Um, and also like local neighborhoods as well. Um, and obviously we've seen how, you know, the role which these physical spaces can play um, in mass mobilizations can make a crucial difference um, to the outcome of struggles and so on. So um, I suppose to come to my question, you know, what role did, you know, mass collective action um, play, you know, in key turning points um, in uh, the uh, revolution in Sudan? Um, and in which of these spaces uh, within the revolt um, do you think actually, you know, pose, you know, the best sort of challenge to state power um, and the power of the regime? Well, I would say for me, um, probably the general strike of May 28th, 29th, which was uh, a two day scheduled strike um, in Sudan, might be the, the mightiest collective action of the revolution in, in Sudan. Um, and it's important also to point out that uh, by May, the sitting has already established itself um, as a state within the state, uh, it had um, its its ways of uh, negotiating and uh, clarifying plans and discussing them and not exactly voting on them, but the people talked about the plans that we have. And at that time, uh, the political leadership of the opposition was already in negotiations with the military council. Um, it was the sitting that pushed uh, the the sitting and the workers in the workplaces that pushed the the military the opposition leadership. To, to announce a strike. We had to ask for a strike again and again. We had to ask for a strike within the sit-in. We met them as they walked 
the, the, the roads of the city and we talked to them and asked them that we are ready for the strike. Workers put out statements um, asking to be called for a strike and actually the workers put out statements signing their name into what was called uh, the Revolutionary Attendance Book, which is um, a tool that is, at least to my best knowledge, was created by the Sudanese Professional Association and at the beginning it was uh, created by them to, to show the basically um, the, the size of the strike and how many will participate in it, but then it was used kind of again them by the workers to show that they are ready even when the leadership does not want to call for a strike but a strike was called for anyway by may 28th may 29th and this was a strike that it basically shut down the country whether it's uh, seaports being shut down airports uh, oil fields uh, mining uh, gold mining uh, fields artesian markets um, private sector corporations it was all definitely shut down and the strike called a uh, caused a dramatic change, not just because of the size of the strike, but also because people learned the, the strength of this tool and the strength of the tool that is their, their work and their ability to withhold it basically from the state or from, from power. And this is a story that I would like to uh, share with you. And it's a story that I, I tell too often, but I still don't think it's told well, often enough, which is the story of the national electricity company workers. Uh, those workers participated in the strike from the first day. And due to that, um, they were arrested. Some of them were arrested by, I don't know, is it the police or national security? It was just basically one of the, the government militias. And they have put out a statement directly after the arrest of their colleagues, where they demanded the, the immediate release of their colleagues. They uh, their statement was addressed to all the security services and all the security bodies within the country and they, they put out a threat to cut down electricity and cause a blackout in all the security uh, offices and buildings in the country. And in their statement they used this phrase, they said, um, um, a million of your bullets does not minna, which translate to a million of your bullets does not, cannot combat one the yeah, press of a button from our side and that was this is a group of people a group of workers who worked together and found their strength and uh, they used it after that of course not just by the strike was a two-day scheduled strike that uh, strike that ended on the 29th of may but right after that on the 30th of may they called for their own open strike for their own demands one of them was removing the security units from the company and of course it was um granted to them within the same day and that is by the administration of the military council at the time so um, and I think Anne points to that in one of her alt articles is that after the strike there was no way that the the council the authority can in any way bring those people back without a massacre it was it was the only way and hence we had the massacre of June 3rd, uh, 3rd. Um, the workers the the masses the protesters saw the power of the strike and that is not something you can walk back from Thank you very much um, for that, um, Mosnan. Um, I'd like to come back now uh, to Hossam, um, because uh, Hossam, obviously, what we saw um, in Egypt, you know, uh, like elsewhere, was you know how the revolution um, and the revolt had really you know mobilised wide sections um, of society, um, including the Egyptian uh, youth um, in Tahrir Square, um, and this happened simultaneously with you know, mass strikes across workplaces and so on. So building on what Mazan has been uh, talking about, um, you know, what can you tell us about, you know, the role of the organized working class um, in Egypt in the revolt 10 years ago? Um, but also more than that, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what was meant by the workers uh, when they spoke about the need to challenge and get rid of the little Mubaraks as well? Um, uh, although uh, the Egyptian revolution was largely uh, described as a Facebook or uh, a youth or a social media revolution, um, but in, in reality, um, the revolution was more or less a climax of years of escalating struggle. And these struggles were various, um, but the most central to it were the industrial uh, struggles. Um, I can't talk much about the organized working class because in our case in Egypt, um, although our working class has uh, a long tradition of militancy and of uh, social resistance, 
But unlike our counterparts in Sudan, uh, I consider the Sudanese left and the Sudanese working class to be much more advanced uh, than the Egyptians uh, when it comes to the, the structures that they have come up with in order to mobilize. In the case of Egypt, our independent trade unions were crushed by the military regime of Gamal Abdel Nasser in 1957. And in general, the later uh, successive generations were more or less uh, politically trapped within the boundaries of Arab nationalism and Stalinism, which posed limitations on the political maturity of what organizations can you create on the ground at the end of the day. So on the eve of the revolution in 2011, Although we had mass strikes in literally every single sector in Egypt prior to the revolution or in the run-up to the revolution, but these strikes were largely spontaneous and the workers were coming up with new unofficial networks whereby they can try to achieve a minimum level of coordination. Uh, something that the Sudanese, when I compare them uh, to the Egyptian case, were definitely way more advanced uh, than us. Although um, uh, the youth in Tahrir uh, were descri described later as the vanguard or as the ones who brought down um, uh, the Hosni Mubarak uh, regime, or at least brought down Hosni Mubarak, uh, observers tend to ignore the role of the mass strikes uh, that happened during the last week of the 18-day uprising. And it's thanks to those mass strikes that uh, the military junta in Egypt were forced to, uh, to depose uh, Hosni Mubarak. Uh, if it wasn't for those strikes, uh, I think that the Tahrir occupation could have lasted for much longer, uh, could have even dragged for months. And I'm not sure that the revolution would have um, managed to make these uh, initial gains. Uh, when Mubarak was toppled, uh, this was temporarily enough for the youth in the squares to leave the squares and to suspend the protests. Uh, and at the beginning, there was so much trust in the, uh, uh, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, Hosni Mubarak's generals, to administer the transitional process. But the Egyptian workers... Uh, took it on their uh, um, uh, responsibility to basically eliminate from the workplaces the thousands and thousands of mini Mubaraks that we had. Uh, the, the worker strikes continued after February 11th. This was the day when Hosni Mubarak was, uh, was toppled. And uh, these strikes were, um, although they were spontaneous and there wasn't really much coordination, but the common denominator between all of them were the demand for impeaching the corrupt managers who were affiliated with Hosni Mubarak's um, ruling National Democratic Party, in addition to forming independent trade unions, in addition to job security. Um, those of, of us, uh, sorry, I mean, those of among your viewers who may not be familiar with the situation in Egypt, Job security in Egypt is a huge crisis. It's a huge crisis. Like someone like me, I lived for 38 years of my life in Egypt before leaving. And uh, I was working in uh, uh, the media industry, which is not a blue collar uh, 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 sector at the end of the day. And I never had a job contract, which meant that my boss could fire me uh, at any time that he or she would want. So these three demands, uh, impeaching corrupt managers, job security, forming independent trade unions, were common among um, uh, the labor strikes that broke out. In some sections, the workers were way more advanced than the others. So, for example, in the energy sector, the workers, among their demands, were impeaching Samah Fahmi, who was then the uh, the energy uh, the minister of energy or the minister of oil uh, and energy resources and stopping the gas exports to israel um, in solidarity with the palestinians and because of the corruption that were involved in those deals 
In the aviation sector, uh, workers also among their demands were demilitarizing uh, the management and getting rid of all of the retired army generals who are given um, uh, positions in the management uh, as a reward. Um, but unfortunately, um, most of the revolutionary community at the time who belonged to the middle class and to the liberal and Islamist forces, uh, they were not keen about supporting the industrial actions in the beginning. And they used to tell the workers all the time that it's not time to strike. It's very greedy for you to demand those demands now. Let's move with the political transitional process and then worry uh, about labor demands. Um, so this was definitely a missed opportunity to radicalize and 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 take the revolution forward to achieve its own demands. Thank you very much, um, Fulva, uh, Hassan. Um, and on what you said, uh, uh, particularly um, around uh, the missed opportunity to go further in the demands that have been realized. I want to bring um, Anne in for the first time uh, in the discussion. Um, obviously, what we saw, um, you know, uh, taking the example um, in Egypt, for instance, um, and elsewhere was, you know, the process of, um, you know, a revolution with, you know, political demands um, and so on, you know, whether that was uh, the getting rid of a dictatorship, the, you know, uh, you know, dismantling the, of a regime um, and so on. Um, but obviously as well, we've seen how actually, you know, social forces, um, in particular the working class, um, but also the, the peasants um, had a key role um, in this uh, uh, revolution um, and resistance. And so I suppose uh, the question I wanted to ask you, Anne, um, is, you know, the relationship uh, between, you know, political revolution um, and social revolution really, um, and how it is that we actually, uh, you know, take, um, you know, political struggles, political uh, upheavals um, into ones uh, that take a social character um, and go much further. Um, thanks, Nadia. And yes, that's a very good set of questions, really. Um, and I think the, the first point that I'd like to make is that actually all of the uprisings that took place, both in the wave of revolutions, uprisings um, that took place in 2011 onwards and in the more recent one that started around 2018, have interwoven these political and social aspects. So the first point really is to make uh, is to is to emphasize that the that revolutions have political and social souls from the start in the case of in the case of uh, of Egypt it started really on the political terrain um, but that built on as Hassam said many years of workers organizing of mass strikes uh, and of uh, and of social demands being raised collectively by the working class in the case of Sudan it started actually initially on the economic terrain over the uh, cuts to subsidies but then moved very quickly to challenge the to challenge the state and that's true for all of the revolutions in the case of of Tunisia it more went from the economic to the political in the case of in the case of Syria it started more on, on the kind of political terrain, but it, it unleashed a kind of pent up fury mm. about the impact of neoliberal reforms on ordinary people in Syria over the previous <laughs> over the previous few years. But the transformatory factor in this, which is something that Hossam and Mazan have just highlighted, is that in revolutions where the organized working class was able to play a, a, a decisive role in the course of the uprising. It opened up a much bigger vista of the potential for uh, far reaching, far reaching change. Uh, even though that in the case of Egypt was then rolled back, there was a counter revolution and so on. It um, interwove this question of uh, of the changes that could be made politically. Um, and really, it, it raised the question of uh, for, for ordinary people of what is the point of simply swapping out the generals at the top of society if we are also you know we live under the dictatorship of the boss in our work if the uh, you know the structures of, of the every, everyday structures of the state are still there oppressing us we need different kind of of, uh, of society and once people got that taste of liberation that Mozan talked about in the sit-in for example their eyes were open to the to the possibilities to possibilities for 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 really a, ma a major change However, it's also really important, I think, to look at the experience around 
how the unevenness of the revolutionary process. So in the case of Egypt, one of the first things that happened um, after the fall of Mubarak was that there was an electoral process was, open, was opened up. Um, the generals who were in charge uh, proposed amendments to the constitution and proposed to hold elections which were going to be the relative, relatively free compared to what people had expe had experienced before, and this was a gain that had been made through mass collective action through the from below through the uprising itself had won had won those democratic gains, and unsurprisingly, many Egyptians actually wanted to uh, wanted to to try that out for themselves, um, even though. Uh, you know, as as I'm sure Hassan will will, uh, will will say if he comes back on uh, on this point, it was running alongside these processes of struggle inside inside the workplaces where people were saying you could go much further, you could extend democracy into workplaces, um, and some places where that happened, you know, in public sector workplaces like in uh, in some of the hospitals in Cairo and to a certain extent in uh, in other state institutions in uh, and so on and so on and so forth, and actually. It it's that uh, interaction between the, the democratic possibilities of organising from below, in particular the, the democratic potential of workplaces as a space where you can uh, you can not only debate and discuss things, but you can take action that actually has a strategic importance to, to society. And again, Hossam and Mazan had some brilliant examples of that um, from concretely how the, 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 the democratic process of workers deciding themselves to take action could then turn into democratic decision making on behalf of a much mass, a much wider movement of a mass movement from below uh, targeting the state. And if you look in a negative sense at revolutionary experiences where the working class didn't play that kind of role, even though in some cases they opened up other spaces for temporarily for, for slightly more democratic ways of organising. Um, you know, for example, in the case of Syria, there was no mass strike. Um, there was no mass uh, strike movement either before the revolution, um, nor really during the revolutionary process. There were kind of um, strikes in the sense of shopkeeper shutdowns and mass protests that perhaps shut down the kind of commercial life of some of the some of the major cities. But there weren't workplaces that went out and, and took strike action in the same to the same way or in the same degree as happened in Egypt, happened in Sudan. Uh, happened in Tunisia, of course, where the revolutionary wave started, uh, or actually has been the experience in Algeria in the in the recent in the recent wave of uh, uh, of protests. And they, I think it's that which starts to show the possibilities of uh, a real and deep extension to uh, to to democracy. But it also has to be, as I said, understood in the context of where people may also be trying out um uh, uh, you know parliamentary means they may they they feel it's a gain that they've won if uh for example more uh, democratic elections can be uh, can be held um and even though those though, those are very limited and i think we'll come later to discuss the problems of of holding trying to change the state through an electoral mechanism which leaves the the the, the old institutions intact particularly the army it's also very important that revolutionaries i think um can see the the unevenness of the revolutionary process and the the way in which people gain that consciousness of their own power and their democratic power in terms of self-organisation at different speeds. Um, and, you know, so that's, I think, a, a, I think a key lesson from all of the revolutionary experiences that we've seen. Thank you uh, very much for that, um, Anne. Um, I mean, uh, to, I suppose to, you mentioned uh, the army um, and the role of the army. Um, and on this, um, I really want to uh, bring back uh, from Sam, really, because um, obviously, you know, uh, pertaining to the specific example around Egypt, you know, despite all the gains made uh, over the course of the revolution, you know, we've seen how actually these became very short lived, um, you know, as the army generals um, and the figures of the old regime and ruling class were able to actually regroup um, and retake power in part by, you know, stoking up the divisions um, in society that people had fought so hard to break down during the revolution. Um, so I want to ask you, I mean, why was it that, you know, the old regime was able to consolidate power again after the revolution? Um, the problem would essentially lie in the, um, 
in the discourse and in the political ceiling of uh, most of the opposition forces uh, that led the Egyptian revolution. Uh, I know some people like to uh, flout um, um, the idea that uh, this was a leaderless revolution, but technically on the ground, it, it wasn't. I mean, there was, there was leadership uh, for this revolution in terms of uh, blocks or political parties that articulated political demands, that spoke in the name of the revolution, that um, invested in logistics uh, for mobilization, and went over to negotiate with the regime uh, settlements and, uh, and compromises. Uh, the Egyptian revolution was led by reformists, and this was its ceiling. Um, People who were, many of them are well-intentioned, but they had liberal ceiling or they had nationalist uh, ceiling. Um, uh, people who regarded the, the kind of change needed to be a change of that would touch the head of the regime, that would, even if we had a revolution, they still looked for some form of incremental change um, uh, via elections and via referendums that were conducted uh, by the military. And at the same time, they bought into the whole idea that if the army falls, Egypt will fall. Uh, we cannot afford um, uh, the shaking of the military uh, institution. We don't want to end up in, uh, in chaos. Um, but the real chaos that we saw in Egypt was actually with the coup and what happened with the coup and, and what we are living in today uh, in Egypt. The Egyptian opposition, the Egyptian opposition pushed for uh, polarization uh, along uh, Islamist and secular lines. So this opened the door for elements from the old regime to infiltrate the opposition once again and to rebrand them, uh, to rebrand themselves uh, as secular uh, uh, in the fight against Islamists and in the fight against uh, terrorism. And that's how they uh, won legitimacy uh, uh, once again. However, uh, people like me in the Egyptian Revolutionary Socialists and in other uh, left-wing groups who were central to the revolution, but at the same time, we were um, we were not big enough to provide leadership uh, for the uprising. Uh, from day one, we were against the military and we advocated um, the winning over of the military, but not the military generals. Uh, we, we were hoping uh, for mutiny uh, among the conscripts and among the young soldiers and the young officers. And if it wasn't for the sympathetic stand uh, of those conscripts and officers in the beginning of the revolution, the Supreme Council for the Armed Forces would have nuked us in Tahrir. There is no question about that. The only reason that protected us was the fact that the army knew if they opened fire that the entire military institution uh, is going to collapse. Thank you uh, for that, Hassan. Um, Hassan and I'd like to uh, read out some questions that people who are viewing from uh, home have sent in um, on those questions uh, exactly, actually. Um, so Sally on Facebook um, has says, uh, uh, what hope uh, do people uh, have in the Muslim Brotherhood as a movement, even though they at some point collaborated with the military regime when people toppled Mubarak? Um, and uh, Terry on Facebook uh, asked the question, um, those states that are essentially intact despite the revolutionary upsurge, um, th those uh, states uh, that are uh, essentially intact despite the revolutionary upsurge, you know, the armed forces uh, such as they are in Egypt um, and Syria are in, are in fact uh, industrial military complexes. Um, so how does uh, the revolution, uh, re revolutionary movement overcome these resilient states? Um, so those are the two questions um, sent in from views, and I definitely encourage people uh, watching at home to send more thoughts um, and comments and questions, and we'll try to read them out. Um, but on those two, um, 
I suppose again, these uh, particularly uh, pertain um, to uh, the uh, wave of, of uh, popular revolts that we've seen um, 10 years ago. But I suppose, um, Anne, um, I'll bring you in first on those questions. Um, you know, going back to what Terry had written, you know, how do revolutionary movements overcome uh, these resilient states? Thank you, uh, Nadia. Um, I didn't hear the questions very clearly, uh, but um, um, I would ask, actually carry from where uh, Hussam stopped, and as he was uh, talking about the, the the question of reform or revolution as it took uh, place in in Egypt, and um, this question it, it remained with us as well. And although the the demands during the sit-in and during the first days of the protest and the revolution were quite radical um the demands called for uh, dissolving for example the the national security services and one of the very first slogans that were written on the streets of al qiyada or the uh, military headquarters streets where uh, where people had the the sit in was that hal jihaz al amn matlab thawri or dissolving the security services is a revolutionary demand um this was very clear at the beginning and although this was watered watered down and tuned down by by different narratives throughout uh, uh, the following days and throughout the negotiation period and then the first uh, uh, months of uh, the transitional government as well and it was watered down to um, uh, to the, the demands of reform and the possibility of reform in it. However, reality was stronger than than any message or propaganda that they uh, they they uh, could could put out at that time. And and we add to that also that the lessons of Egypt were still clear in the minds uh, of people. And one of the slogans that were chanted repeatedly when when um, at the sit-in when when the reform was brought up as. Uh, uh, as a possibility or of a path for the revolution, although it's a very sad slogan, but it was basically Imma Nasr wa Imma Masr, which is victory or Egypt. Yeah. People had that on their mind and that radicalized them um, to, to, to some extent. Right now, um, as I said, reality overcame any messaging or propaganda that the state and the authority was putting out, and even the idea of reforming uh, the National Security Service is um, is, is a joke uh, to people. Um, people saw that those uh, security forces are still being used to oppress them, uh, whether it is if they are protesting or just going by their life. Uh, so that is not is no longer something that can be uh, can be supported by masses um, in in any form. Uh, maybe the the army still does not um, face the same scrutiny, and um, that is unfortunately due to that. Well, the the vague and confusing concept of patriotism is one that is still exploited by many, and it's one that is still you know. Uh, cherished by many, and there is a lot to be done on on that. But that protects the army to to some extent. However, it, it did not stop at the the security institution, which uh, which are the obvious ones um, as tools of, of oppression of the state. It's obvious that those tools cannot be used by by the masses for their for their own good or benefit or progress. Uh, but it also went into the civilian. Uh, institu civilly and quote unquote uh, institutions uh, of the state. And an example of that, I will give the example that the demands, for example, right now of uh, the protesters in the gold mining areas who are protesting against the environmental impact of gold mining in their environment and health, um, they are demanding dissolving the Sudanese um, mineral resources company. Uh, they are aware that this tool cannot cannot be used, which is a governmental company, cannot be used for their own good, even if, which is the case right now, that but at the top of it sits a manager who is coming from the op uh, opposition, coming from the peripheries of the country, and even um, an ex-member of uh, armed resistance. But that did not change the, the company into a tool for the people. It changed the person into a tool for the, for the state and for the authority and for the same ruling class. So those mistakes that we made, to, far, to a far extent, they, they mainstreamed that uh, the tools of the old state cannot be used for the benefit of the new system that we're trying to create. And um, that that is basically, that is what we, we would have wanted to start from <laughs> at the beginning of the revolution. So we don't, you know, fall back into the, into the current failures and mistakes that we've made and that we're living the consequences of them being again under um, a military uh, regime with a civilian face. However, that gives me hope that the next resistance or revolutionary wave is gonna start from, uh, from a, a much better 
from a bit much better point, from a point that is uh, way less um, open to the concepts of um, of reform. Um, yeah. Thanks um, for that, Mazan. I want to go back to something uh, you were talking about um, earlier in this, uh, the discussion, um, you know, the anecdote from your sister um, about feeling safer in the streets in the course of the uprising and so on. Um, you know, Sarah, from uh, who's uh, somebody viewing from home, um, has posted a question that very much links to that. Um, so I'd like to come back to it, um, you know, saying that, you know, it's very much noticeable, Mazan, um, and yourself and for women uh, in uh, Egypt uh, and Sudan uh, at the time of the revolution talks about feeling safe in the streets. Um, you know, has the effect remained the same? Uh, has, has the effect, this effect remained uh, for women um, or has this been something that's been rolled backwards? Um, so I'll leave that uh, to, uh, to answer, Mozan. Well, you see, um, anyone who has been to Sudan uh, three years ago, maybe before before the revolution and right now, would be very capable of seeing that um, uh, women and young men as well are um, more expressive on, uh, of themselves. They're capable, and this was an issue in Sudan. It was not possible. The state would not allow you as a woman to wear what you want. So people are, women are now more capable of doing that. And although um, it did roll back, and actually, to be honest, it rolled back for certain classes. So it remained for the upper and middle classes. They still have their freedoms. And we can see that even in the kind of um, laws and legislations that have been changed or put by the transitional government, being a government that is basically for the upper and middle classes, um, is that the, the legislations related to women are the ones uh, that are related, that will impact mostly the upper middle class uh, women. There were no changes related, for example, uh, to uh, uh, labor rights. There are no changes uh, related to, um, uh, you know, um, given rights to the millions of women farmers who are basically working, um, helping in their husbands and fathers' lands. But they are the, the core of the Sudanese economy to a far extent. Those women, whether they are, um, uh, you know, farmers um, uh, on the uh, in pastoral economies and so on, those are not considered over there. So the the rights of women has been rolled back with the exceptions of those related to the upper and middle classes women. And that is what you expect when you have a government that is basically, this is the constituency of this government. It's the upper and middle class and they will work for it. So yeah, that's what we're seeing right now. Thank you uh, very much uh, for that, uh, Mozan. Um, you know, continuing on, you know, the question around um, oppression, liberation, and the possibilities opened up um, in the course of revolution. I want to come back um, to uh, Hossam uh, on this, um, because similarly, what we saw um, in Egypt, as mentioned, was, you know, for instance, women feeling more safe, but also we saw, you know, groups that had previously been oppressed in society, um, you know, coming to the fore um, of, you know, the, the revolt that we'd seen uh, 10 years ago in uh, Egypt and so on. Um, and so in remembering, you know, the common phrase that is used, you know, how uh, revolutions are the festivals of the oppressed, you know, how do you, uh, how do you see um, the way in which this was something born out, um, in, out of your experience uh, in the Egyptian revolution uh, 10 years ago from now? Um, the Egyptian revolution, um, when it was in full steam, uh, not just during the 18 uh, days, uh, of the Tahrir occupation or like the first Tahrir occupation, but all throughout the coup till, till the summer of 2013, the revolution unleashed the creativity of the Egyptian masses um, on all levels. Uh, artistically, we had uh, graffiti on a, on a scale that is unprecedented uh, in, in, in our modern history. Uh, music, street plays, um, you had the rise of um, uh, of bloggers and um, and activists all throughout uh, the Egyptian provinces, and they were coming up with the most creative uh, animation, the most creative um, um, articulation of demands for their generation, um, and also for the different social groups in our society. It was their festival. Um, especially those groups who had been put down for uh, generations. 
so the Egyptian Copts, for example, who are the Egyptian Orthodox Christians, who make uh, from 10 to 15 percent of the population, they went on unprecedented mobilizations uh, uh, demanding uh, their civil rights and the elimination of religious sectarianism from society and all forms of discrimination. Uh, other uh, religious minorities uh, uh, also mobilized. Uh, and if you want to talk about gender, um, Egypt, which is a very sexist country, uh, which has a notorious reputation, unfortunately well earned, uh, for, um, for sexual harassment uh, of women in both the public space uh, and within the work uh, place. Um, and where women sometimes can could be targets of mob attacks, uh, mob uh, sexual attacks. And it was also uh, a weapon used by the Mubarak's regime against uh, dissidents, whereby they used to unleash criminal thugs to particularly uh, uh, target women uh, activists and women journalists. Uh, during the 18 days, uh, I mean, according to the accounts of, of many, this is not just my own personal opinion, uh, Tahrir was different uh, at the time. Uh, sexual harassment was not really uh, an issue uh, in Tahrir during at least the first 18 days. But it was with the start of the counter-revolution, uh, more or less, uh, after the 18 days were over, that the issue of sexual harassment became much more organized and much more channeled and much more institutionalized against women revolutionaries uh, in the squares. So as more or less to marginalize them and to drive them out of the scene, I'm not necessarily implying a conspiratorial um, um, approach to the phenomena uh, because at the end of the day, sexism is entrenched um, uh, in society and uh, in the state, but I'm more or less here referring to the political forces that would benefit uh, from this. Uh, does this mean that uh, women basically uh, took the abuse and were silent? Uh, no, I mean, there were different initiatives that also did not exist in Egypt uh, prior to the revolution that fought sexual harassment uh, uh, on the squares. Now, with the defeat of the revolution, uh, you know, with the military coup and the ensuing massacres, um, counter-revolutions do not take uh, society back to square one. They take it to square zero or below zero. Things do not return to how they were. They become even worse. So I would say that the situation of Egyptian women uh, following the coup as well as the situation of any other um, oppressed group in society, uh, their situation has gone worse. But at the same time, um, since we are Marxists, we understand dialectics and we understand that the picture can never be completely bleak and can never be also completely good. You know, there is always interaction, you know, I mean, happening uh, dialectically. So although the situation of women has become so bad in Egypt, but at the same time, they have gained so much courage to speak about those injustices and those abuses. So over the past three or four years, for example, um, and these are years where dissent in Egypt could be uh, at its lowest level ever, at the same time witnessed the rise of a Me Too uh, movement in Egypt that exposes sexual harassment and that goes after sexual harassers, uh, um, including those even within the uh, activist community. So, so as you can see, it is the festival of the oppressed that turned into a mourning, um, more or less, and, and a tragedy. But at the same time, the memories do not fade away. Um, and even, uh, I mean, if I compare it, for example, to my generation, I mean, I was born uh, in 1977 and I was among those who joined uh, the ranks of uh, left-wing dissent in the 1990s, prior to the age of the internet and social media. In order to look for any information about our tradition, 
Uh, we had to uh, look for books that were censored, they were banned, they were out of print. But now the entire history of the Egyptian revolution, our festival of the oppressed, it's preserved online and it will continue to act as a visual memory of the class. Thank you for that, um, Hassan. Um, now I'm supposed to move on to a completely different um, uh, question. Um, and um, I'd like to bring, uh, I'd like you to come in on this first um, and then perhaps uh, we should uh, turn to Anne on this question. Um, but it's really around the, the question of Islamism uh, really, because you know, here in the West, you know, the term Islamist is one that is made to, uh, to evoke a lot of fear, uh, is one that is uh, made to be vilified and so on, despite how varied you know, Islamism actually is um, ideologically um, and so on. Um, and of course, you know, when we're thinking about this treatment um, of Islamis Islamism here in the West, um, you know, much of that is uh, mixed with uh, Islamophobia in society. Um, I suppose, you know, thinking about this question in the context of the popular uprisings that we've seen, you know, um, I want to, I suppose we can start uh, with you, Anne. Uh, I want to ask, you know, uh, what role actually had uh, Islamists Islamist, uh, played uh, within these movements and revolutionary processes? Um, and what position should revolutionaries take um, on the question of uh, Islamism? Um, thanks, Najee. Yes, the question of Islamism, as you said, in relation to how people see this in often in, in Europe is very much uh, shaped by the context of uh, experiences of colonialism, of the racist way that the uh, existing states in, in, in Europe and in, in North America target Muslims uh, with Islamophobic laws and at the same time are engaged in imperialism, uh, occupying largely Muslim countries uh, and, uh, uh, and working, for example, um, supporting countries like uh, the State of Israel in the suppression of the Palestinians, who are a, a, a large Muslim population and, and also Christians. Um, so that's kind of got to be in the back of, I think, in the back of everyone's minds. We talk about Islamism, which, as you said, quite rightly, is a very um, diverse phenomenon. Islamist movements in general are, are cross-class movements. They involve uh, people from a range of different social classes. And depending on the context, they may go down often one of two routes in terms of the of how they mobilize people. There are um, reformist Islamist movements, uh, which tend to look to um, elections where they're available in countries where there are not electoral opportunities. They'll try and seek other mechanisms to uh, to mobilize, to bring about reforms and changes to, to the state. Sometimes this is, but obviously for Islamists, this is couched in a language of, a, 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 of Islam and references to, Islam, to Islamic law. Um, but really the attraction that they hold for, uh, for, for ordinary people who support them is often that they articulate uh, a vision of, of gradual and small scale changes in society that seems much less drastic than revolutionary change. And in the case of the first wave of revolutions and uprisings that we're discussing here, the 2011 uprisings, both in Tunisia and in Egypt, mass uh, Islamist movements existed that had that kind of reformist orientation. And Hassan mentioned about the Muslim Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt. In the in the case of Tunisia, it was a movement called a Nahda. Um, both of those two movements played a relatively similar role in the revolutionary process. They actually tended not to be in the front lines of the initial wave of the revolution, it, although some of the younger activists from the Islamist movement were drawn into the into the revolutions as they started. Um, and in fact, sometimes in the case of Egypt, against the the wishes of the of the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood, they, some of the young activists from the Muslim Brotherhood were in the square in Tahrir Square uh, when I visited on the fifth and sixth of, uh, of February two thousand and eleven. This, it was very clear um, that we're, there were a layer of, uh, of younger Muslim Brotherhood activists there at a time when their leadership was still kind of wavering about whether they should negotiate behind the scenes uh, and, and, and so on. And as I mentioned previously, they also then attempted to um, negotiate their way into uh, in, in, into power and to take part in the ele in the elections. And likewise in, in in Tunisia. But what's really important, I think, here is not to lump those types of movements which although they they often have reactionary ideas um they're not the same as the kind of uh 
radical movements, so Salafist inspired movements in the Sunni tradition, for example, um, who tend to look to individual terrorism or, or violent action against the against the state, um, which is the other the other kind of uh, stream within Islamist or, or organizing, which has been very prevalent uh, across large areas of the uh, of the Middle East and, and made an appearance in most of the revolutionary processes as well. They tend to be small armed vanguards, which don't really have an attraction to ordinary people, except in the in the context of extreme kind of chaos and destruction of uh, of civil war. And 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 in the case of in the case of Syria, um, the factors that I led to I talked about earlier, the fact that the organised working class was not able to make that decisive intervention in the uprising in in, in Syria, was unable to um, finish off or fracture. Um, at least the top of the, the the institutions at the top of the state at an early stage, uh, meant actually created a space in which um, the armed uprising against uh, against uh, Bashar al-Assad came to be dominated by armed Islamist groups, many of which had extremely reactionary politics and were bitterly opposed to the kinds of uh, a kind of liberatory. Uh, the goals of the early phases of the uh, 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 that dominated in the early phases of the Syrian revolution. They're certainly opposed to kind of mass collective action from from below. So when we talk about Islamism, it is extremely important to think about it in a nuanced way. And the final point I just make here really is also that I think assessing what happens in revolutions and the and the the roles that are played by different actors in the revolutionary proce process, it is very impo important to compare across different political perspectives and to see that sometimes people uh, organizations that have very different politics can play very similar roles because they take on this uh, the, the, this role it's a kind of role like uh, a, a, a role of a uh, uh, faust in the classic tale making a deal with the devil to try and negotiate with the arm with the with the army with the core of the old state in order to bring about change from uh, from above and it's very striking in the case of sudan although islamists in sudan were part of the old regime uh, were in alliance with the old regime actually that i would argue that the, uh, the 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 other reformist forces that have come into power now have found themselves in a very similar position to the islamist reformists in egypt 10 years ago in that they are sitting down and being part of a government and part of the uh, uh, and trying to run the state with the very forces that are likely to try and unleash a counter revolution against them Thank you for that, um, and um, I'm supposed to move on to the final part um, of uh, this discussion this evening. Um, you know, I really want to back now to uh, Mozan really, uh, because um, you know, Suzanne obviously showed that you know the problems at the root of the revolts ten years ago, um, you know, continue to <clears throat> exist uh, today, um, and actually, you know, the potential for revolutionary up upheaval hasn't really gone away uh, gone away either um so i suppose you know thinking about your experience you know what lessons do you think uh activists and revolutionaries can draw from it um and take forward uh in struggles to come well i think just like from uh from egypt um sudan is a clear case of how a revolution cannot be led by reformists. Um, it could not have been clearer and also a very clear case of how power cannot be shared, especially that uh, the current setup of the government was basically presented as a shared um, shared governing process between the military and the civilian and reality showed us very clearly that is that that is not um, doable in any way. Um, however, there is another, I wouldn't call it a lesson, it's more of a question that I think is raised um, in a very you know, it's just raised right in front of us. And I don't think, I, at, at least for myself, I haven't heard an answer for it, um, a reasonable answer for it, which is the question of uh, what do we do when when we are at the point of international interventions or mediations? Um, like, this is a table that the, the masses, the protesters have, have no chair at, they have no voice at, and even the most committed revolutionary leadership, if for some reason ended in that table, will not be able to change it much because there's actually a global system that is actively working into rebalancing the situation towards you know, preserving the status quo, uh, basically. And um, be that, whether that intervention comes in the killer 
Interest conferences or um, the African Union mediations and uh, negotiations and deals, um, we found we found ourselves in Sudan out of the discussion by the moment of the of um, of the international intervention and and um, I would argue that even even a general strike cannot combat that. Um, this is a situation where where the where the power and the state becomes the power of the state becomes you know across borders and international and at that moment. A national resistance can in no way uh, combat an international system or international power. And um, I, I actually, I would ask everybody to think with me and share with me uh, their ideas on how, how do we combat that moment? How do we still remain relevant as the resistance uh, at uh, as the resistance at this moment, especially that those governments have got much better at doing those kind of interventions in the past 10 years, given that their first failures and all that it caused. And um, I don't know what the answer for it might be, whether it is that even the general strike needs to go across borders, that may be for a revolution in the region to be successful, we're going to have to see um, you know, a strike of all the ports of the Red Sea or a strike that shuts down the aviation in the Horn of Africa. I think this is something we really need to think about because, because that's, that's the biggest question that faced us and this that was to a far extent the moment that we were totally out of the equation and never managed to come back with the same strength thank you very much for that um Muzan. um i'd like to um now really direct uh the question that you ended with um you know how is it you know as the people who, you know, uh, you know, these struggles are attempting to challenge uh, um, an overthrow, learn better how to, you know, protect their power, protect um, their position in society. You know, um, what is it that we can do to make sure that actually um, those struggles against them can actually still win? How do we, uh, what, how do we deal with um, the ways in which they will learn um, how better to maintain uh, their own power? And on this, um, I suppose. I wanted to uh, bring Anne in uh, on this question. Um, sorry. Um, and then we can come to Hassan uh, at the very uh, end. But, um, you know, thinking about the, the uh, ruling classes and their, their resilience, um, what do we say? Um, you know, seeing uh, what do we say to those um, concerns around the question of, you know, whether actually they can be sort of pushed back um, and actually defeated? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, Mozan's raised a really important point, which is that a revolution that starts to raise a challenge to any individual state will suddenly find itself um, facing a whole, you know, fa facing the fact that capitalism is an international system um, and that states uh, interact with each other across borders and actively intervene to try and to, to push the forces of, of counter-revolution and to encourage them. I mean, one of the things that has been quite noticeable about the um the waves of revolution in the in the middle east um over the last 10 years is the way in which regional forces have played a counter-revolutionary role so for example the countries of the gulf in particular like saudi arabia and united arab emirates have played a particularly um de devastating and destructive role in kind of counter-revolution both in the 2011 wave and in the more recent one where they've been trying to they've been propping up the the the, the worst bit of the uh, of the suit of uh, Bashir's state and uh, working hand in glove with uh, 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 with the military and uh, people like um, the leader of the rapid support forces, the Janjaweed. Um, so, Muzan asked a very good question: What can we do about this? Well, one of the mm -hmm. lessons I think we can take from the revolutions in 2011 and beyond is that actually solidarity can spread across borders, um, and that when crisis hits in one state that actually many many people will be facing the same kind of questions the same social injustice uh in the neighboring states this is one of the reasons why revolutionary movements absolutely have to be internationalist they have to be anti-racist they have to stand side by side with refugees they have to stand against scapegoating and xenophobia and oppression and, uh, and and division, um, and to turn you know to turn that solidarity for, to uh, to to our advantage, it also really underscores actually the importance of solidarity uh, for those of us living in countries like Britain, uh, in European the European countries in America, 
our governments are at the heart of this global system in a way that the Sudanese state isn't, in the way that the Egyptian state, uh, despite the megalomaniac ambitions of Abdel Fattah Sisi, uh, is a bit player in this uh, in, 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 in the global system. But we are right in the heart of the of these countries, and what we do actually it really matters. We can organise. And if you think about actually the issues that connect us, also we're all facing the same the same crisis over, for example, the climate, um, that we have an absolute uh, an absolute interest in from our, our own perspective of building links of solidarity, for example, with uh, with ordinary people, with workers, with the poor in countries in, in the Middle East, which happen to produce oil, we need to work. We need to work and show that we are part of the same movement to stop the fossil fuel companies and the dictatorial regimes and our own governments from burning the planet under us. And the so the rise of mass movements like the uh, uh, the the climate strikes and also <laughs> movements like Black Lives Matter. Uh, which again spread across spread spread across borders very quickly. It's not it's not something that has created the conditions for a revolution in uh, uh, in in Britain or in in the US, but it's raised a lot of questions for people about, for example, the role of the police. Um, so you know, a year or so ago. Not very many people in, not as many people in Britain would have been taking a radical position of saying, uh, you know, what's wrong with the with the police. The police abolitionist movement has massively grown in the states as a result of um, Black Lives Matter. And that raised fundamental questions that our comrades in countries like Sudan and Egypt, Tunisia and elsewhere in the Middle East have, uh, have been grapple, grappling with through the revolutions. So we need to organise and we need to build movements of solidarity. And as I mean, I agree with Mazan, we need to be able to organise general strikes across borders uh, uh, for, for the next wave of revolution. Thank you uh, very much for that. And, um, and now Finally, I would like to come to Hassan um, to really close this discussion, really, because I think, um, you know, as has been highlighted throughout the event this evening, um, also more broadly in the events uh, we've been talking about, you know, we've seen the massive potential to transform society and challenge all of its, you know, turmoil and inequalities, you know, in the mass revolts we saw um, 10 years ago and since, really. Um, and evidently, you know, struggle will happen, um, you know, and people will, you know, feel, you know, enough is enough um, and stand up. Um, but, you know, is it enough really to wait for these big explosions um, of anger to happen to transform society? Um, or is there more we need to do to make sure that actually, um, you know, these, these struggles um, come to their most radical conclusions? Uh, I think the uh, major lesson that... Um, um, that we should have learned from um, the first wave of the uh, Arab revolutions is that we need to be organized and we need to be organized way in advance uh, before the revolutions break out, not wait till the revolution itself breaks out and then we will create our own network of revolutionaries and hope that the spontaneity of the masses will take us forward. Uh, things do not happen this way. We have to organize. Um, of course, revolutions do not happen by wishful thinking um, and, and not just by uh, hoping uh, for it to happen. Uh, I mean, I hope that a revolution would happen tomorrow in Egypt, but that's not enough and it's not going to happen uh, tomorrow. Uh, the scale of defeat um, that the Egyptian revolution or the first wave of, of Arab uprisings, um, not just in Egypt, but I'm talking about the region, the first wave, wave was largely either defeated or co-opted, like in the case of Tunisia. But that does not mean that the story is over. And, and that's because the revolutions broke out because of deep structural problems that uh, are endemic uh, 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 to the uh, systems in the region, um, the most important two important the most two important problems are police brutality and political repression on the one hand, and the second problem is the lack of social justice, uh, the social inequalities that we have. The counter-revolutionary regimes in Egypt and elsewhere did not provide answers. Uh, to these two problems. Actually, you can argue that the situation now is way worse than, than, than it was in 2010, 2011. 
Hence, the objective conditions for a revolt to happen once again in the future remains. But at the same time, in order for the revolution to happen, there has to be also some subjective interventions on behalf of uh, uh, the political uh, activist community. This community, which got completely crushed by the coup in 2013, uh, most of our independent unions, if not all of them, have been crushed or besieged. Our political parties have been also crushed or besieged. Uh, youth movements, you know, I mean, more or less ended. Most of the organizers are in prison. Um, we have roughly 60,000 political prisoners in Egypt, including some of my own comrades. Um, and uh, I believe that um, as we are talking now, uh, the admins of the event will uh, leave some links in the comments section uh, for anyone who, um, who wants to know more about the plight of the Egyptian political prisoners and how uh, he or she could uh, help uh, uh, with these campaigns. So this, so the revival of such organizations that have been crushed is um, uh, an important precondition uh, for the revolt to happen once again in the future. Spontaneity is not going to bring down the regime. Uh, spontaneity can topple the head of the regime. Spontaneity can 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 pressure those in power into giving some reforms. But in order to have a completely successful revolution, you need structures that can sustain the mobilization, that can organize the general strike, that can extend solidarity to our brothers and sisters uh, uh, outside our borders, like, for example, Sudan, that can adopt a foreign policy of actively exporting the revolution other than appeasing uh, uh, regional powers. Um, and I am optimistic. Um, and I'm optimistic simply because I've read history. I know that it's not the end of the story. Uh, people's confidence might have been gravely uh, uh, affected because of the defeat. But at the same time, um, things cannot last like this forever. Thank you uh, for those last words, Hassan. And I'd like to give a massive thank you to all three um, of our amazing speakers for leading tonight's uh, discussion. Um, you know, and Alexander, Muzan, uh, and Neil, and Hassan Al Um, You know, a massive thank you to you all uh, for leading the discussion this evening, and a big thank you to everyone um, at home for joining um, and contributing with your thoughts, comments, and questions. Um, and, you know, before we draw tonight's event to a close, um, I think it's worth uh, making three uh, final announcements. Um, you know, solidarity is, of course, very, very important. Um, and like Hossam uh, had mentioned, you can take action to support the fight to release political prisoners in Egypt. Um, and so what I encourage everyone to do is to please uh, follow the link uh, for Egypt Solidarity Initiative uh, and to check out their website to find out more about what you can do uh, to support those campaigns. Um, the second thing is, you know, I think what tonight's discussion really highlights is the importance of ideas and political uh, clarity. And I think actually books are a weapon uh, in that fight uh, and so on, particularly when we face, you know, deep and complex uh, uh, problems and challenges. Um, and so actually, I think, you know, it's very uh, important that we arm ourselves with ideas and so on. Um, and so I'd like everyone to also check out uh, Bookmarks uh, Bookshop as well uh, and their website. Bookmarks is a radical uh, independent socialist bookshop um, with a whole array of books, you know, whether that's on imperialism in different parts of the world, histories of resistance, radical fiction um, and so on. So please do check out their website um, and support their shop. Um, also, you know, please don't stop there um, because I think if you enjoyed tonight's discussion um, and agree with uh, the speakers that we fund uh, that what we need to do is fundamentally transform society um, and not just change those at the top of it. Um, then we'd like you to join the uh, Socialist Worker Party. Um, I think, in particular, in the context of uh, the pandemic, you know, it sh uh, shone uh, a harsh light on you know all the existing fault lines in society. Um, and what is clear is it's not going to be good enough to simply be uh, the best activists in whatever respects you know 
climate justice war, against repression, what have you. Um, you know, we need to be, uh, we need more revolutionaries um, on the ground, um, particularly for when, you know, the next upsurge of struggle and revolts uh, uh, happen. We want to make sure that they actually realize their potential and be, uh, you know, building uh, a different type of society altogether. Um, and so if you'd like to be um, a part of that project, um, then, you know, join us in uh, the SWP um, and let's fight together on that. Um, but big good evening to uh, everyone for joining um, and we'll see you at the next Facebook Live. Till I'm not